I am presenting Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 9, Sunday, January 29th, 2023. The lesson is entitled, Blessing of Belonging in Christ. The lesson text comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 31. Related scriptures are Romans 12, 3 through 8, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. The place is from Ephesus. The time is 55 AD. According to some estimates, there are approximately 33,000 Protestant denominations in the world today. How does this vary, this variety of de denominations correlate to Paul's teaching that all believers are in one body in Christ? What do Paul's words, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 mean? John Gill has commented, the church of Christ is not one person only or does not consist of one sort of persons as only of Jews or only of Gentiles or only of rich and free men or only of men of extraordinary gifts and abilities or greatly eminent for grace and spiritual knowledge, but many. So in the mystical body of Christ, the church, there are many members, yet all one in Christ, the head and all relate related to each other. Today's aim, facts. To understand the biblical emphasis on believers being one body in Christ. Principle. To accept that unity in the church is achieved through the work of God, not people. Application. To minister effectively in our local churches with oneness of heart. Illustrating the lesson. Each person in the local church operates to further Christ's work. Practical points. One, the Holy Spirit unites many members into one body to do God's work. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. Two, believers should neither boast, boast of nor belittle their status in the body of Christ. Verses 15 through 19. Three, every gift is critical to the healthy functioning of the church. Verses 20 through 21. Four, Behind the scenes work is often most critical to the success of a ministry. Verses 22 through 24. Five, the members of Christ's body are inseparably bound to one another. Verses 25 through 26. Six, believers must accept God's gifts for them and not envy those of others. Verses 27 through 31. Golden text. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is the worth of the members, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 20. The second is the harmony of the members, 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 26. Third, the gifts of the members, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. Introduction. One of the most important keys to the success of an organization is a proper division of responsibilities. All of us are familiar with the elaborate bureaucratic structures that characterize national, state, and local governments and big business co corporations. Educational institutions also require clear-cut divisions among administrators, faculty, and supporting staff. Bureaucracy, of course, can become dysfunctional, but all recognize a need for organization appropriate to the purpose. The Church of Jesus Christ is more than an organization. It is a spiritual organism deriving its life from God and having Jesus as its head. Nevertheless, its effectiveness depends on each member recognizing his or her spiritual gifts and using it in harmony with others. The worth of the members, 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For the body is not one member, but many, verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body, verse 16. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body, verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where where were where were the hearing if the whole were hearing where were the smelling verse 18 but now have god set 
the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him, verse 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Verse 20. But now are they many members, yet but one body. Matthew Henry made the following comments on our lesson text for this week. Christ and his church form one body as head and members. Christians become members of this body by baptism. The outward rite is of divine institution. It is a sign of the new birth and is called, therefore, the washing of regen regeneration. Titus 3, 5. But it is by the Spirit, only by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, that we are made members of Christ's body. And by communion with Christ at the Lord's Supper, we are strengthened not by drinking the wine, but by drinking into one's spirit. Each member has its form, place, and use. The meanest makes a part of the body. There must be a distinction of members in the body. So Christ's members have made different powers in different places. We should do the duties of our own place and not murmur or quarrel with others. All Christians are dependent one upon another. Each is to expect and receive help from the rest. Let us then have more of the spirit of union in our religion. The principle stated, 1 Corinthians 12, 14. After explaining the concept of gifts bestowed by the Holy Spirit to glorify Christ, verses 1, 11, Paul likened the church to a body of many members unified in Christ, verse 12. It has been brought together in one spirit from many backgrounds, verse 13. This spiritual unity is a remarkable phenomenon unmatched by any human unifying force. But then he began to stress the need for diversity in the unified body in order to achieve its spiritual goals. For the body is not one member but many, verse 14. The point he was about to develop is that to function as a body, the body needs the, the contribution of each separate part. Illustrations from the human body, 1 Corinthians 12, 15 through 17. To illustrate problems that can hinder the church, Paul offered a whimsical but pertinent speculation on what would happen if bodily organ, organs refused to accept their proper functions. The foot, for example, might say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. The foot will therefore stop functioning as it should and deprive the body of an essential ability. Something like this was happening in Corinth. Those who had, had spectacular gifts, tongues, were exalting themselves. Those who lacked such gifts became discouraged and assumed they had nothing to contribute, depriving the church of gifts they did have. Extending his illustration, Paul, Paul imagined the ear saying, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, verse 16. As the foot degenerated itself because it considered the hand superior, so the eye sees itself as inferior, so the ear sees itself as inferior to the eye. All would agree that hands and eyes are essential, but no one would argue from this that feet and ears are unnecessary. Yet equivalent arguments in the church left some members discouraged or disgruntled and the church impoverished. Paul showed how nonsensical such thinking is. If the entire body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the entire body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? Each organ is important, but there would be no point to, the, to its ability without the rest. So it is with members of a church who think their gifts are the only important ones. By despising others' gifts or trying to force them all into one mold, they are actually destroying the spiritual body of which they are a part. Church leaders ought to encourage all their people to discover, develop, and use their gifts. God's Sovereign Distribution, 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But now turns attention from, from hypothetical illustrations to the actual facts. Instead of fashioning the body of just one or two organs, God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it have pleased him. We marvel at the body's efficiency in spite of its complexity. All parts cooperate to achieve what it was intended to do. 
if God has the wisdom and power to design our bodies to operate efficiently, can he not fashion Christ's spiritual body, the church, in the same way? It is not our prerogative to question his design or impose our own interpretation of how it should work. We should welcome that the, the diversity of spiritual gifts and seek wisdom in how they can be used. The summary of the argument. Now, Paul now recapitulated his major point that the body cannot exist apart from its many members. And if they were all one member, he asked, where were the body? The, the unstated answer is that there would be no body. But he immediately asserted, but now are they many members yet but one body? This is a self-evident truth about the physical body, and it is true of Christ's church as well. The harmony of the members, verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Verse 22, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Verse 23, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncommonly parts have more abundant comeliness. Verse 24, for our comely parts have no need, but God have tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, verse 25, that there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another, verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it, the necessity of harmony. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 23. Paul now resumed his illustration but shifted the emphasis from body parts that feel useless or deprived to those that feel independently sufficient. If the eye says to the hand or the head says to the feet, I have no need of thee, they are deceiving themselves. The eye looks at the desirable object but without the hand to pick it up, the desire is left unfulfilled. The head, with all of its reasoning power, cannot move at all without the cooperation of the feet. So it is with members of the body of Christ. The Corinthians needed this admonition, this admonition because some of them were glorifying in their gifts and despising all who lacked them. Factions had developed, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 11, and were evident even at their observances of the Lord's Supper, 11, 18 through 22. Their, their inordinate emphasis on tongues had led to disorderly services, chapter 14. Their abuse of Christian liberty caused them to wound weak consciousness, 8, 9 through 12. Thus, Paul reminded them that rather than to be despised, those members of the body that seem weak or feeble are all the more necessary. Many bodily organ, organs are not visible and, in fact, need to be protected inside the skin and bone structure, the heart, lungs, digestive organs, and kidneys, yet they are essential to human life. Likewise, the body of Christ, many members who never minister publicly, are nevertheless the lifeline of the church. They may actually be more important to the church than those who have a public ministry. Paul went even further, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. 1 Corinthians 12, 23. This describes parts of the body that, that, that modestly tells us should not be exposed. So we bestow on them more abundant honor through clothing. Thus, the more presentable members bestow comeliness on those that are unpresentable. God's provision of harmony, 1 Corinthians 12, 24. God recognizes that our comely parts have no need. To conceal them would be to hinder their effectiveness. But he has put the body together in such a way as to give extra honor to the parts that lacked it. God has interspersed the weaker members with the stronger, the less presentable with the more attractive, so that all members partake of a common honor. As a result, the entire body presents an attractive, unified appearance. 
all are blended into a harmonious whole and all members can rejoice that the body not only works smoothly, but also presents a pleasing appearance to, to others. The outward, the outworking of harmony. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 26. God has blended the members together so that there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. In the church, as in our bodies, God has arranged the members in a way that will promote unity, not division. He has given all members the opportunity and responsibility to lavish on one another the same kind of care they bestow on themselves. Sadly, the Corinthian church was not experiencing this harmony. 1 Corinthians 1, 11, 11, 18. The members had all the gifts necessary to do so, but their spiritual maturity did not match their giftedness. The Corinthian church had difficulty experiencing what comes naturally to the physical body. If one part suffers, the rest of the body suffers with it. Or if one part is honored, the rest of the body rejoices with it. The same principle should be true of the church. Paul urged the Romans, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep, Romans 12, 15. To feel no reaction to either one is evidence of a serious spiritual problem. Ironically, it is often easier for believers to sympathize with those who weep than to rejoice with those who rejoice. Some of us are too self-centered to rejoice when, other, when another is honored. The gifts of the members, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, verse 28. And God have set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, verse 29. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, verse 30. Have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more ex excellent way. A listing of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 27-28. From his use of the human body as an illustration, Paul moved to his intended lesson. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The church is an organism that is to live out and manifest the life of Christ. Within this organism, individual believers make up its various members. Each believer has a vital role to fulfill, but each must know that he or she is but one member, not the whole body, and therefore needs the contributions of all the others to make the congregation's ministry glorifying to Christ. Paul then listed spiritual gifts that contribute to the church's health. The list is not exaltive, but it gives good representation of gifts known to the Corinthians. Paul made it clear that God does the giving. He also indicated that there is a definite ranking to the gifts. Paul saw that the Corinthians were exalting lesser gifts precisely because they were sh they were surer. The he therefore had to set things straight. The first rank belonged to the apostles. These were the men who had who had seen the risen Christ and were commissioned by him to plant churches and give them his authoritative teachings. Second, God gave the church prophets. These were people who received new revelation from God and passed it on to the churches as occasion required before the New Testament canon was completed. The third group is teachers who have the ability to expound and apply truth that has already been revealed. These first three gifts are ranked ahead of the others because they are involved in communicating the content of the Christian message. In the latter parts of 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul listed gifts such as miracles, healings, helps, governments, and diverse tongues. Helps refers to all kinds of ministrations to other members of the body. Governments refers to administration and it is instructive that what is regarded as a high office in human organizations is given a lower ranking in the church. Finally, tongues, languages is pointedly ranked last. The importance of diversity. 1 Corinthians 12, 29 through 30. Paul now posed a series of rhetorical questions, all of which anticipated a negative answer. 
Choosing a sampling of the gifts just enumerated, he showed the folly, the folly of thinking everyone in the church should have them all. God has bestowed gifts on all his children, but he has left each of us a vacuum that can be filled only by the gifts of others. Advice to the church, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Paul ended this discussion with the command, but covet earnestly the best gifts. He was saying, you are right in wanting God's gifts, but ask him for those that are most useful in edifying the church as a whole. These would be especially prophecy and teaching. But Paul was about to show them something even better, the way of love, which he would expound in the next chapter. So in effect, he was saying, desire the most useful gifts, but more important, show love to one another in using the gifts you have. Questions. One, what potential problem in the church did Paul illustrate through the foot and the ear? Two, how were self-important church members harming the church? Three, what should we welcome the, why should we welcome the diversity God has given the church? Four, how were the Corinthians destroying the harmony of the church? Five, how does the vital importance of physical organs that are hidden relate to spiritual gifts? Six, how can a church of diverse elements represent a unified witness? Seven, it is easy for Christians to rejoice and sympathize with each other. Explain. Eight, in Paul's list of spiritual gifts, which ones did he rank higher? Why? Nine, how was Paul's ranking of gifts a rebuke to the Corinthians? 10. What was Paul's advice to believers at the end of this passage? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, January 29th, 2023. Thank you for listening. God bless.